How you doing everyone? It's Luke from LukeCurtis.co.uk and just listen to this for two seconds. It's me Matthias Hombauer and this is the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast episode 35. You know, invested in the camera equipment to go and shoot for free and the reason I did it was so I had a, a portfolio so then I could go and ask for business. So that's my recent interview I done over a podcast with um, a project which is called How to Become a Rockstar Photographer. So they approached me off the back of the YouTube video I did about should you or should you not work for free. Um, and obviously once they approached me, because I have done and would continue to still work for free on certain projects, I was like, yeah, sure, 100%, I will, I will jump to this. And you know, the whole doing stuff for free really rang true to me earlier this week because basically I watched a YouTube video with the guys from Social Chain and a chap called Steve in it. Um, Steve basically, um, he had an interview with Rankin and Rankin is like one of the greatest photographers in all time, like in my personal opinion. And Rankin basically was asked, you know, what advice could you give any photographer, you know, if they're just starting out and they want to pursue this career? his advice was like continue to do stuff for free like find the right things to do for free that will uh, help you in terms of like your progress because he described it and his analogy and description was basically like planting a seed and that rang really true to me because the way I see it is like I have my goals and aspirations up here and to get there like there's these steps and each of these steps are like a little milestone and you have to achieve stuff on the way to get closer to that and if you use the analogy of planting a seed, like say for instance I could plant a little seed and I could just get a little bit of growth, it might take me one or two steps closer to the goal, but I could plant a seed, you know, for free, like I don't really consider it's going to be huge, but it could basically sprout into this massive oak tree and before I know it I've got to climb a few branches and I'm not two steps or three steps, I'm 20 steps ahead of where I need to be and I'm closer to that goal and that aspiration. So, you know, for me it's really important to still take time. To, to things like this and, and do things for free. Um, with sort of, you know, don't don't expect anything back. Like don't expect to plant something and be like, yeah, do you know what, this is gonna go into this. Just give time to something that's got potential. And I think that's really important, you know, throughout your career as a photographer. And hopefully you'll pick up on some of that from this interview. So the rest of this video is gonna be about the interview or it's gonna be basically the audio file from the interview that I had. You can find it obviously in iTunes, you can find it on Android. I'll put all of the links into the sources for it and also the website. So if you wanna use it as a resource to uh, propel your career or understand what the, you know, the pros do in the industry, 100% it's a great resource for, for doing that and also I'll attach the video from the guys at Social Chain because I, that interview for me was, was amazing like Rankin is my all-time favorite photographer and Steve like congratulations you know you've done it in such a very informal relaxed way you got the best from 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 yourself and also from Rankin and I think you touched on some really strong points so if you do have time available listen to you know this podcast listen to some of the other photographers podcasts and also you know watch the video that steve at social chain has produced because spot on um so enjoy it and thank you everyone for subscribing i'm now at 95 subscribers which you know in the grand scheme of things is is nothing but i've said to myself i want to get to 100 before the end of the year and it goes back to those steps like that's just one of those little steps i want to achieve so i am five people off and the date today is the 20th, so I have 10 days to get five people. So, you yeah, know, here goes. Wish me luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Enjoy the video. It's me, Matthias Hombauer, and this is the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast, episode 35. You know, I invested in the camera equipment to go and shoot for free, and the reason I did it was so I had a, a portfolio, so then I could go and ask for business. You will get access all area to the best music photographers on the planet, where they share their secrets, successes, and crazy stories from their rock star life. Join me on this journey, kickstart your concert photography career, and start living your dream right now. Welcome everybody to a new episode of the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast. I want to say a big thank you and a shout out to all of you guys who support my podcast project. 
it's starting to skyrocket. And um, there are so many people who are mailing me and sending me messages on social media how they love my podcast. And I honestly appreciate it. It's so great to get all your feedback. So keep it coming. My main vision for this uh, podcast project is to interview the 100 best concert photographers or music photographers on this planet and to finally wrap all the findings I got up in a book, which might be called the Concert Photography Bible. <laughs> I'm not sure about it right now, but uh, so this is my vision. I want to write the Concert Photography book where I extract all the findings that I got from my 100 interviews. If you like the show and the podcast, you can now support it on Patreon. This is a way where you can get exclusive access to my How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast universe. There are different rewards, starting from $1 per month. Whether you like to ask my future podcast guests your questions, or you want to hang out with me in a monthly mastermind group, I'm pretty sure you will find the right package for you. It will help to support the show, and I would really appreciate it to see you in the VIP area. So, if you want to support the show, go to hdbarb.com slash podcast VIP and you will find more information. We got more than 100 five stars reviews on iTunes. We have more than 35,000 downloads so far and we're in Spotify. So this is uh, the big news for this week. So let's continue to my guest today. Um, his name is Luke Curtis, based in England, and uh, I'm really excited because he's one of those guys, like myself, who likes to share his thoughts on photography and how to get started. So we will talk about why you should shoot for free, especially in the beginning, to build up your portfolio. We will talk about how to deal with negativity if... Um, some other guys will tell you that you shouldn't do it for free, but you always have to get paid. But as we all know, this is not that easy in music photography. And sometimes it's better to think out of the box and not only money related. Luke will reveal his approach when it comes down to building your portfolio. How many photos should you use? Should it be online? Should it be offline? Should it be soft cover, hard cover, and so on? Also, we will talk about the most challenging part of the music photography business, how to earn money. And Luke is a prime example from someone who started out shooting for free and transitioned into a pro photographer, where he get now paid for his assignments. So without further ado, let's jump right into the interview. Thanks for being my guest on my podcast, Luke. How are you doing today? I'm very well, actually. Yeah, very well. It's uh, it's a little bit cold in the UK. We're starting to get towards the uh, the, the, the the depths of winter, but um, but no, we're great. Right. But it's not snowing like in Vienna. <laughs> no, right not snowing in Vienna. We <laughs> apparent, apparently we're expecting some soon, which would be nice around Christmas. But yeah, not not okay. yet. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, tell me more about how you got started as a photographer. Sure, of course. So um, at the time I was working for Sony, so I was quite, uh, you know, I was quite far along in a senior role working for Sony, training people how to sell TV. So okay. I, I built all of the training content for a field team for the UK. It was up wow. to 100 staff. I was based at Sony head office and really into my technology and I was expecting my daughter and one okay. of my colleagues said to me, Luke, you know, get a camera. You don't want to miss any part of her growing up. And I said, sure, mm. you know, great idea. So I went and, and bought a camera and it's really cliche. But, you know, <laughs> the, the moment I bought a camera, I, I just knew it was for me. Like it opened up. I, I never believed I was creative and it opened up an avenue for me mm. to be creative and, and be able to express myself in certain ways. And it was then just a case of time, really. And eventually I left my role. After I'd built up a portfolio after a certain amount of time, I left my role at Sony to go off and be a photographer. But the starting point was preparing for my daughter's birth and making sure I could record it and, and buying a camera to do so. But it's sort of taken me on a, a totally different journey, which is, which yeah. is good. 
That's a great story. How old is your daughter now? Um, she's now seven years old. So oh, I've wow. been taking pictures for, for seven years, you know, and it's there's a real good synergy between her age and, and where my mm. career has gone as a photographer right. because the, the starting point was her eff- effectively, which is, mm. you know, it, it creates a great bond between me and her. Mm. Yeah, my daughter is one and a half years old now and I totally get your point with uh, taking photos of her. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's so important. I think you, uh, yeah. you want to catalog their them growing up and they change so much and for me as a a parent my advice to any other parent is they never get easier but they get more Mm. rewarding and you know Mm. the more rewards you get from them and you do stuff and you take pictures of it you have this catalog of just this this life and it's it's a phenomenal thing and you know i know as a kid if i spend time with my parents and they pull out pictures you know film pictures and we Mm. go for it it's an amazing experience and because we're in the digital era there's so much more of that available so we can really truly catalog stuff and and not risk losing it you know as long as you document right. it correctly it's great yeah that's that's uh, definitely an advantage to our parents because <laughs> i know some of the polaroids they took but i think it, it was still expensive back then and you were rather limited with taking thousands of photos of your correct kids. <laughs> uh yeah so what i've seen on your homepage, you started out as um, um, yeah, shooting events or DJ photographer. Yes, yeah, is this correct. Correct. Yeah. So, kind of my you know not exclusively, but predominantly, I work in the dance music scene, and mm-hmm. the reason so is because as I started to get into photography and was building my portfolio, I, I, I grew up in London, and I was always part of the clubbing scene, going to places like Ministry of Sound and Fabric and Egg and all these really famous clubs and. It was always very special to me and my friends and and when I decided I wanted to go into sort of that style of photography I wanted to be somewhere that I enjoyed and and it made sense to go down that route because I Mm. enjoyed the music and I was passionate about the photography it just seemed to create you know a really good synergy between the two Um, so yeah so I started off predominantly shooting the events and then it slowly now moved into working more closely with the artists and shooting portraits Mm. which is amazing like I've shot some of the, the, the you know the superstar DJs of the world and it's 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 unbelievable. It's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's fun. Uh, even though I most likely shoot uh, rock bands and rock stars, uh, yeah. I started off with Fat Boy Slim. Oh, nice, uh, excellent. And, and was working with. So this was the the first professional photo shooting I had with him. He, uh, yeah, I got thirty minutes for portrait session before his concert, <laughs> which is really rare and i didn't have it bef- uh, again so normally it's just one or two minutes uh, because these yeah. guys are really busy and he was really relaxed and said yeah let's do 30 minutes and i was oh shit but what should i do with 30 <laughs> minutes I, i'm just in the backstage area okay there is a couch and there is a wall but uh, yeah it, it ended up great and it was also on the stage then with him and so this was my first experience um that's really fun- cool yeah yeah la- funny in uh, um uh, yeah for a dj um but yeah, yeah, and a good DJ to have nice. as well, and to get that time with right. him is is amazing. So I have yeah. shot, you know, I, I do shoot, uh, I have, and I do shoot live gigs and stuff. But I think for me personally, like I, I, I I'm drawn to the dance music, and I find it, mm. you know, because I connect with the artist more. I, I you know, I sort of right. do, I do it more. But yeah, gigs, I think gigs are amazing, and I think gigs are amazing because as I'm a, a music fan, like I love, mm. I love real instruments and and. A, a song has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's so much more authentic in that sense. Um, so yeah, so it, it isn't a preference to one to the other. It just seems like I have built more of a portfolio towards the dancing, mm. so I kind of stick with that. Okay. So, what would you say were your challenges when you started started out as an uh, event photographer? Was it uh, the access, or was it also uh, getting photo passes for this? Or how does it work in the yeah, dance music scene? Yeah, I think. Um, in the beginning access is definitely a huge issue access and credibility for access because Mm. no one's going to say to you yeah sure come along if you can't if you don't have anything to show that you can come along in the first place so you know you're you're kind of on a whim just approaching people and being like Mm. hey can i come and shoot your event and they say have you shot anything else do you have a portfolio to show and it was it was really difficult to get a foot in the door and i remember there's a photographer called uh, Ryan Dingham and he's now one of my friends. But back when I, back when I started, he was the guy that kind of inspired me to go down this route of photography and sort of the music industry. And I, I remember getting in contact with him through Instagram and I was like, Hey, can I have some any advice? And, um, and sort of tried to get some inside information to be able to how to go about approaching it. But mm-hmm. the, the hardest thing was, was definitely getting the access. But once I, you know, once you get the first access and you, you then have some images to show 
like it then becomes easier and easier and you have to be really savvy in terms of it's, it's a business effectively you kind of you know you take pictures you make sure you present the best of those pictures the next time you try to gain access to a to an event and you just show these these portfolios off but the the dance music industry is a lot smaller than the you know commercial mu- pop mm. music and and rock music so everybody knows everybody and once you start to become credible, it becomes a lot easier and you, you gain much more access. Right. And, and people, you know, I think you get to a certain point where your work is good enough. People actually want you there. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I've kind of got to the point of having, a, you know, credible enough name that people want you there, mm. you know, which is, which is a real good accolade to have. And I think that's because it's a smaller, smaller sort of industry, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a, also a good approach because if this is uh, your love uh, of the dance music and this is a niche in the niche, so to speak, yes. in the niche of photography. So the smaller the niche, the, yeah, the more familiar or probably Correct. not easier, but, but different it is because yeah. uh, as you might know with, if you're shooting the, the big stars like Metallica and Kiss and Iron Maiden, everything gets complicated yeah. because you need to sign contracts and there are 50 photographers waiting in the photo pit and everything. And you have free, so, free songs and you don't get to right. decide on the free songs. Yeah. I've been, I've been in the pits and I've experienced it and you know, it's, 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 it's very, you're, you're correct. It's very complex in that sense, but you're be, you're dealing with, you know, huge, huge, huge um, artists and bands. And obviously there's the legalities that sit behind it. So you have to mm. do, you have to do all these things. Like there's a, there's a hope inside me that as dance music becomes more and more mainstream, I think the dance music superstars are going to be what the rock stars were of the sixties and seventies. Like I think we, we, you know, Mm. the house music scene has that potential, uh, which would be amazing, you know, to be sort of that big. And you do see it now at festivals, you know, uh, sort of, you know, mainstream sort of dance music Mm. artists playing at festivals. It's, it's great, but it's really complex, the pits. And I'm quite a, I'm really laid back and the pits, the pits scare me a little bit to be a certain degree. Like it's very <laughs> intense. So my hat goes off to anybody who does it. <laughs> uh, how is it with the three songs rule in, in the dance music scene? Is uh, there any rule or can you shoot the whole uh, concept yeah, normally so in a club? With, um, with the house music scene, there is, you don't have that rule. Um, what you will do is there tends to be tiers in terms of your access. So you may have, you know, main floor access so you have access to sort of mingle with the crowd and then you would have stage access um, and then you can get AAA access, which is obviously access right. or areas. And, and that's the one you want really, because then there's no limitation to, to, to getting involved with, with all of the artists. Because what happens is, as the night goes on, the artists become bigger and bigger and the bigger mm. artists, they tend to not want the photographers that just have floor access or, or you know, okay. they want people that have AAA because they are the, the ones that are going to produce the better images and are credible. And also because they, they tend to have experience, you know, they've got experience spending time with artists like that. So they don't go all weird and get starstruck and stuff. And, you know, they just get on with their work and, and you know, it's quite, all a, right. so that's how it but, works. So you have the whole, but then, sorry, no, but then you uh, already need to have a connection to the artist. Don't yeah, you? correct, correct. Um, and sort of now, I I turn up to events, and you know, I, I'm recognised by artists, and you say hello and mm. how things, and and that's a real great place to be in. Like that's it's, it's phenomenal, right. but it takes time. It takes time. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about your uh, recent YouTube video where you suggest uh, to beginners in photography to shoot for free. Um, and as far as my experience goes, this is an, a really emotional topic and there are even Facebook groups such as stop working for free. And, uh, yeah, it, it can go, um, really nasty <laughs> with, with some guys, if you, if you suggest this. So can you share your approach with me when it comes down to, to shooting for free and, uh, don't get paid for your work yeah. and especially for whom this, um, applies? Of course. The so the, the reason I thought about doing the, the video is because, as I've sort of come further along in my career, I've started to do more stuff in front of crowds of photographers that want to progress in their career and stand up talking. And I, I wanted to look at things that I've had real challenges with in the past. And, and the, the first one is, you know, building a portfolio that's credible enough to be able to go and get work. And I think the starting place for that is shooting it for free. And you are very correct. People can be very hostile and negative and aggressive towards it. Like I've had, I posted the video on a range of Facebook groups and I won't name any in particular, but one, one group in particular, I got some real, real negative feedback from and, you know, and I think 
for me, I find the negativity comes between the generation splits. It tends to be the the more experienced, older people that have been around in the scene for a longer period of time. They're the mm. ones that like they really dislike it. They, they you know they don't I'd never work for free. But there's a huge part of me that believes there's no way anybody just buys a camera and walks into a festival and has the ability to shoot. You have to have a starting point. Um, so the video was just explaining about my experiences and and I. I, you know, I worked for nearly two years for free. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I would always say it as invested in myself, you know, I paid to mm. get to the gigs. I, I did, you know, I, I, I got myself there and, you know, invested in the camera equipment to go and shoot for free. And the reason I did it was so I had a, a portfolio. So then I could go and ask for business. And when people say, oh, what have you shot previously? I'd have a professional portfolio to show a range right. of images and a range of scenarios to showcase my work. And, and, it worked, you know, I'm now a, a, a professional freelance photographer and, you know, I'm paid, you know, I'm paid, it, it, I'm paid enough to be able to live as a freelance and that's phenomenal. And it's because I started in that way and I strongly encourage it. And but in my video, I do mention that don't continue doing it for free. And I think some photographers struggle with the break point where they have to say, do you know what? I now have worth. I now need to start being paid for doing what I'm doing. And that's, a difficult challenge you know a difficult conversation to have but i think it's some look at some point every photographer has to have and they have to make the decision to say do you know what? my work is now good enough to be paid mm. i'm going to ask to be paid um, but you can't get there and also the building the portfolio it's training you know when you shoot at concerts and gigs so say for instance you're a, a portrait photographer if you want to practice you can go and ask your friends and family but shooting gigs, there is no practice for shooting gigs. You you can only do it there. Right. So so when you're going to these places, you're you're practicing, you're refining your ability and your technical ability to become a photographer. So it's not just about the images you put in print or the images you put on your social media. That's practice. That's you becoming better mm. and better and better. And it's so crucial. Mm. Um, how did you come up with the idea to to shoot for free and build up your portfolio? Did you get any such suggestions from other photographers, or was it like a trial and error, and then it it felt yeah, it's the right way? It was it was trial and error, and you know my so sort of my education was in marketing and business, and I'd done really well in a corporate environment working for companies like BlackBerry and Sony and and O2. You know, I'd spent a long time in sort of the real business world, and it was a case mm. of taking that you know that business understanding and trying to apply it to photography and saying okay right how do i how do i market myself correctly and i said if i've got no pictures i can't market myself so i need to go and get those pictures but i can only get those pictures at these events so mm. you know you have to get in and i approached i you know at the time i was i was living in norwich and we only had one real promoter in that area and I um, was shooting some stuff for them, but I realized I, I, I wanted to go further than that. Not, not to say it was, you know, you know, it wasn't worth it, but I, I knew I wanted to get into the bigger clubs in London. So I kept on making approaches at clubs in London and promoters in London. Eventually I came really lucky with a guy called um, Steph. So Steph is one of the residents for a record label called Abode mm -hmm. and, and they are, they're doing phenomenally well. They have a residency on Ibiza and they play that, like they, they've grown so much. And he, I approached him and said, Hey, can I come to a gig and take some pictures of you? And he said, yeah. And, and that was the door had opened for me okay. and that was the first step. And I, I will always be grateful and thankful to, to Steph. Like, and, and we're really good friends now. I work with him three four times a year regularly he always comes back to me to have his press shots taken and you know he's the one that ultimately opened the door for me in, mm. in, into the industry so i'm so so grateful i see so what would you say was uh, the key taking home message from the corporate world into your photography world because you said you worked in marketing yeah you, you know you knew how to to do business so what what would be a kind of the the most important point that you took with you because corporates yeah. um, definitely I, don't give anything for free, right? Uh, I think, yeah. So for me, it, it's a really old school marketing saying and I and I say it to everybody and you know, anybody asks my advice and the saying goes, if they can't see it, you can't sell it. And, mm. and, and that applies so much to photography. So what I would say to people is, you know, if you want to go and be a concert photographer and you want to be a gig photographer, if, if you don't have proof of that, you can't continue to do it or you can't build on it. Mm. So you need to, you need to have that there and tangible to go and do it. You know, 
say for instance you went into a grocery store and you wanted to buy something if you can't see it on the shelf you're not going to be able to buy it you know and it's the same with your photography so it's a really simple saying and you know regardless of how complex your education could be and your experience in business it's a really simple rule that i live by and it works in mm. business and it, and it works in photography and i just carried that through effectively yeah that's that's great and, and i think this is what a lot of people miss because they just see okay i want to shoot my favorite band like metallica and uh <laughs> but i don't get a photo pass and they get frustrated and uh, i just stop doing it but uh yeah as, as you mentioned i mean people have to realize that it's a, a long path it's a long way it's not like uh i always say uh overnight success is a myth so this is not really uh, happening correct. to most of us or to 99 percent for sure there are some some guys out there who who have cool stories to tell where it worked out but um i think in general it's it's hard work for everyone uh, and um I, i totally agree and i say to people for me i think if you pursue any art and whether that's music photography uh painting drawing you have to have what i would call an unhealthy obsession with it because <laughs> exactly <laughs> because you will get knocked down there will be failure there will be a lot of failure but you need to treat those as a learning experience to make yourself better. And if you don't have the passion, those failures are enough to make anybody walk away. And, you know, when you do have that burning desire and you do have that obsession, every time you fail, you just say to yourself, do you know what? I'm going to do it better next time. And you, and you, you, right. come, you come back around and, and that's what will give you the ability to, to, to go far. And, you know, I've been taking pictures and I have a really clear record of it for seven years and I didn't always do gigs and, and you know, I didn't always do that. It started off shooting so many different things to try and build up the, the portfolio to move into this in, to, into the industry mm -hmm. um, but yeah seven years it's taken me to, to get to this point cool yeah and i i always say to people like um they they really have to be passionate about this otherwise a, a normal guy wouldn't do it i guess because if you see it as a job then anyhow you will quit after a couple of weeks <laughs> yes exactly because standing in a, in a loud environment in the night and uh, probably uh yeah doing the post-production yeah in the in the early morning don't get paid for it so why should you do it well that, yeah you're very correct because <laughs> it's basically like in the beginning you would shoot until like three four o'clock you know in the morning like three three a.m like especially with dance music i guess yeah it's crazy and you have to edit the pictures and they want to turn around in 24 hours and and then you're not getting paid for it and then you still have to go to your day job and right, right. oh man it, it can really it can burn the candle at both ends as they say <laughs> but exactly but if you're passionate about them then everything is cool and Correct. Uh, you, you wouldn't see that as a job. Uh, so talking about um, getting negative feedback and um, dealing with with drawbacks, yeah. how how did you deal with it? So were there uh, times where you thought of quitting because it, it went too far away, or was it always like okay, you know what you're doing, you have yeah. your goal in, I, in life? So I think photography was was a bit of a savior because when I when I left my job at, at at Sony, I and I wanted to be a photographer, and I said this is what I was going to do. I done some like really menial jobs, like some boring jobs for you know bad companies and stuff. Whilst I was trying to be a photographer to have enough money to pay the bills, but I got in a really sticky situation where you know eventually I was running out of money from my redundancy package from Sony. I had to sell my car to pay my mortgage, and I had to move out of my apartment because I was, I owned the apartment. I had to move out to let somebody else move in so they could pay rent. So I could mm -hmm. live in a cheaper place basically. So I could continue to pay my mortgage. Like things were really bad. And, and I never, I never gave up on photography. I knew it was what I wanted to do. And I, I kept on pursuing it. And it got to the point where I was, I was at the bottom of the barrel and, mm. and then things started to happen. And, and that, you know, I, I forever feel indebted to photography and, you know, regardless of how sticky the situation got, I was like, no, this is what I want to do and I'm going to make it work regardless. And yeah, there were some difficult times for sure um, and some, some real negative times. But I, like, once I have a camera in my hand, it's almost like being a different person. Like I have so much confidence in myself and, mm. and, and where I can take it. And um, and yeah, so yes, it's been, it's been dark and sort of sticky at times, but <laughs> I never once said I was going to give up. Like I never, ever, ever. And I right. think, that's, and it goes back to that obsession, that, 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 crazy mad you know passion obsession with photography right. you need it you need it to to sort of uh, to go far in this career exactly you you need this approach because otherwise you you won't get far and the cool thing is at least from my experience uh always when you think you have to quit the next day it's 
the, the whole roller coaster ride starts again, so to speak. You get an email, you get a call, yes. uh, and okay, it, it's it's moving on. Okay, yeah. let's let's have money for the next month and see what's happening then. <laughs> no, you're you're very 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 correct, and I think it goes back to my marketing experience when stuff like that happens. So, for instance, like this this conversation that we're having now and this podcast, and mm. you know, I will. I will market this stuff, you know, I'll, I'll put this stuff out and it goes back to the, yeah, if, they, if, they, if, if, if they can't see it, you can't sell it. And, and, you know, I want to talk about every time you have a success, some people are embarrassed to share it, regardless of how big the success is, share it. Like the video I put mm. on about how to get published in a magazine, I shared it to a group and some guys were like, oh yeah, because DJ Mag is a great magazine to be published in. And I just responded. I said, yeah, it may not be for you, but for me, this is huge. And it's so important mm. to me. And everybody right. has a different barometer for importance. And this to exactly. me is super important. And his response was, I'm sorry, that was really rude. And it just, you know, it's, it, you have to be really honest. Um, everybody has their own benchmarks and goals that they want to work mm. towards. And, you know, and yeah, just, just use those successes to propel yourself forward, regardless of how big the su success is. And mm. some people may have done better, of course, hundred percent, but your answer to that should be, well, you know, I'm only just starting, I'm, I'm going to get there. Yeah, that's an important point because uh, always value yourself and your success and uh, don't be just frustrated because your friend or whoever posted uh, a photo in, or get published in Rolling Stone and you're just in a small online magazine. 100%. But, for he, but for you, it's huge because that's probably your first publication and Correct. this is how everyone starts. And so, and I, I've seen this a lot and I've, I've talked about this also in other podcasts with other guests like it's hard or it, it's not a wise idea to um to have a look at other photographers work in too much detail and then try to copy them and then you get frustrated by the time because they say oh there are so many cool photos there and i don't know if i can do it and then i look at my photos and i'm getting frustrated because they're not that good so i think it's always important to yes, yes stay true to yourself and um yeah, get, get inspired by others, but don't try to copy them and then, you know, get frustrated. 100%. That's such, a, you know, you know, that's such an important comment. I, and I totally agree with it. Like always, always take inspiration from others, but don't ever try to do the same as them. Like never, right. ever, ever. And that's, and that's the thing when I, you speak to photographers and especially in the, the, the photography sort of like music scene, they say, oh, it's so competitive. There's so many people doing it now because it's so easy to buy a camera. And I say, mm. well, we don't always do the same thing and we shouldn't all be doing the same thing. It should be totally different from every single one of us. And if it is right. all the same from two, you're not original, you know, go and be original. Mm. And that's why it's, and, and that's why I say when people, you know, say it's, oh, it's really competitive. You should question yourself. Like you, you don't want to be competing. You want to be producing your own stuff all the time and, and it'd be very unique to yourself. Exactly. So you were uh, going from shooting for free to become a published photographer um, who actually gets paid for it. So <laughs> how hard was the transition? And uh, w when did you have the feeling that uh, it's right to go this route and um, yeah. and get paid? Because this is also, I think, uh, as you said, a kind of a point, a turning point for many people who are probably not or don't have so much self-esteem mm. and uh, don't know how to handle the business side and yeah. if they're already um, ready, so to speak, to, to get paid. Spot on, no. So in, in terms of how I got published and, and when I was starting out, again, the photographer that inspired me, I, I, his inspiration came to me whilst I was looking through magazines. I was, I was like, you know, where do I want to take this? And I was looking at magazines and seeing people's pictures published in there. And I just had this light bulb moment. I was like, I need to be published. Like that's where, that's the next step for me. So I, I kept on approaching publications such as uh, Mix Mag and DJ Mag and NME and um, Vice and Thump and just kept on sending my work to them, you know, like sending mm -hmm. pictures. And I soon realized, and there's a video on YouTube about this as well. I soon, I soon realized that, it was by the time I got the news to them, it was old news. It wasn't it wasn't relevant because it had already happened, it was a bit late, it wasn't exclusive. So what I started to look for was cool stories, you know, what, what was going on around me in the music industry that I could be involved with that would get my images into the, the magazines and it'd be exclusive. And I the, the, when I was in Norwich, the guys who run the event called Yaya, they were holding a mm -hmm. charity they were holding a charity event for a chap called Sam Alga who who tragically passed away at an Elro event in Barcelona the year before. And because they were holding this charity gig and it had so much meaning and value, I approached DJ Magazine and said, hey, I've got a really cool story. I would love to shoot for you guys. And 
And this was a free shoot as well. I wasn't being paid for it, but it was my way of getting the foot in the door. I said, I've got a really mm. cool story. I think you guys would love it. It's got so much meaning uh, for dance music. Would you be interested in covering it? And they said, yeah, sure. So I went and shot the event. I did an interview with Sam's brother, Robbie, and and it got published. And and that was my, my foot in the door cool. with DJ Magazine. And what they saw from that was, you know, I was... Uh, professional enough to be able to do the work and the quality mm-hmm. of work was good enough for them and, and it just led to more and more commissions and it, and it built from there which was was amazing so again it just shows you know putting yourself out there and working for free will always lead to paid commissions because it's it's the proof you know it shows people that you can do it and, and it will build from there mm. and i love this i love the story because uh, you actively approached the, the magazine and said hey Guys, yeah. I have a story, and then do you want to cover it? So most people are just sitting at home and waiting for the for the <laughs> cell phone to ring or, or some manager. So this this is not how it works. Yeah. So you have to be actively involved in the things, and yeah, and, and the, the better the better you prepared, uh, the easier I would say yeah. it gets. I became a I became a news reporter. Basically, I was no longer taking pictures. <laughs> I was like a yeah. I was a news reporter. I was going out and trying to find news that I could get in the magazine, and it was right. It's, it's an exciting experience. That's awesome. And um, I think I have a bit of a saying as well. Like you have to you have to be involved to be involved. And what I mean by that is with the dance music industry, you know, you have to be involved. You have to know what's going on around you so you can be involved in it from a business perspective. Mm. And because I was involved in the music industry and I knew what was going on around me, that gave me the ability to identify that story. And it still happens now. Like I regularly will go to events, not to take pictures. Like I'll go to events just to enjoy them and be involved with my friends within the industry, just so you know what's going on. And and that involvement just solidifies your, your positioning. You know, I mm. think it's very difficult to just turn up, take pictures, go home. I think that's, that's got no longevity. I don't think you can last in the right. industry like that. You have to be involved. Right. So talking about, um, it's important to, to showing your work in order to get a job. Um, you suggest to have a printed portfolio. Yes. Um, what's about a printed portfolio? So most likely people have online portfolios. Yes. Um, can you of let course. me know more about a printed portfolio and, and how you came up with it? This is a question from, a, from Andrea, a podcast listener. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, and she wanted to know more about, um, you mentioned it already in the, in the video, but maybe you can go about more in detail. So, you know, print, printed portfolio, how many photos should be in there? And Sure. So the reason I, I think printed is very important is because with, with the digital era, you know, everybody's moved to digital and no longer film. The problem with digital, it can be a it can be a problem, it can be a benefit. But I see it sometimes as a bit of a problem. Is it loses its value because it, it, you know it's easy to buy a 128 gig memory card and shoot a million pictures, and you know those million pictures will you know lose lose value. Mm. When you print something, you know, say for instance, you decide to use 28 images in your portfolio. There's only 28 of those images that you've hand selected and you've put them in an order that makes sense and flows. And mm. there's so much commitment and thought to that process. And you're creating something that's very personal to you. And I think when you present that to people and it feels premium quality and it's tangible and they have to, you know, Instagram, you can flick for a hundred pictures in two or three seconds. Whereas with a portfolio, you'd like people put it down and they flick the pages and they feel it with their hands mm. and they slowly, like they become engrossed in it. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing to watch as soon as you hand a portfolio to somebody because they never flick through it the same way they would Instagram. And for me, you know, in a business sense, it adds so much value. Like they start to take time and, and then they, they value it and then they value your work. And then that makes the transition between asking to be paid and not be paid so much easier because you hand them this portfolio with real value. And you say to them, you know, and they flip through and it's, I find it so much easier to ask to be paid or you don't even have to ask to be paid. Like people can see that it's got worth. So they're happy to pay. Um, mm. So I think it's really important to have a printed portfolio and, and to get in front of your clients. Um, so have an online portfolio, of course, hundred percent through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and whatever platform works best for you, but always, always have something printed and, if you get the chance to get in front of clients, like make sure you have it and make sure you hand it to them. And, and something I learned mm. from my time working for Sony in Japanese culture, they have a tradition <laughs> of when, when they hand something over, 
they hand something over with both hands as opposed to just mm-hmm. hand it with one hand. And, and the right. reason they do that is because it's precious and they don't want to lose it in the transition between one person to another. So they hand oh, it over with two hands so it's secure. Okay. And I always make a point of, of doing that because it's it's valuable to me. <laughs> and I'm now I'm now holding handing that responsibility over to you and it's it's so important to take. So uh, that's kind of a, a couple of things that I would uh, always always use and do. <laughs> That's that's a good point, and uh, I totally get it that uh, a printed book uh, always attracts more attention than just an online portfolio. The drawback that I might see is um, you have to get in front of clients yes, directly, right? Yeah. So if I'm sending some some um, photo pass application uh, to to some bands somewhere in the US, it's rather hard to send them an um, yes a portfolio. My, my printed portfolio book. And also it's very expensive. So right. my my way around that is what I what I do is my portfolios, I will take little short videos of them and I'll put them on my social media. So when I do send uh, my invites for photo passes, I'll have my links to my social media. And if they take a few okay. seconds to scroll through, they will see the videos and they will see printed portfolios. Uh, so, so yes, that's a good idea. So yes, they don't have it tangible, but they can see that the care and consideration and, and diligence is there in producing it. And they say, hey, you know, and I think any any photographer that wants that's to take genius. them. That's <laughs> genius. <laughs> so that's, it's that's a, a good idea. It's, it's a virtual portfolio. You can, you know, or you can send them yeah. a link to the video. So say, for instance, now I've got the video on YouTube. If people ask to see my work, I'll send them the video. And in a business marketing sense, I'm getting more hits on my YouTube page. They get to mm-hmm. see the work is printed. So I get more work. I get more hits and everything starts to continue to build together. So so let's see if, if a lot of uh, YouTube videos <laughs> popping up now <laughs> after the podcast <laughs> from people showing the work. But no, no, that's genius. That's a great way to do it. Thank you very much. So what do you think is the best format for a portfolio? And um, h- how many pictures do you normally include that it's not getting overwhelmed? I mean, I yeah. have here a, a book from Neil Preston, which has, I don't know how many pages, mm. like 300 or so. So I my recommendation would be 28 or 30 pages so it's a a good size and on those pages try to use a maximum of like if you if you take one page the most you want to use is two pictures but like Mm -hmm. a fashion lookbook so if you ever look at a high-end fashion lookbook what they will do is they will take a series of images from that particular shoot and they will put those into the lookbook so for instance if if you look Mm -hmm. at my portfolios i'll take two images maybe three images from a shoot And I'll combine them together. So you have a range of different looks within the shoot and a range of examples of my work. So not only does it look cool, there's diversity in in the work. Mm. So it's not just the same stuff over and over again. And I think so. Maybe you have you, so. Maybe you have two pictures on one page yes, and one picture on the other page. Correct. Yeah, and and that works really well. And I think twenty eight pages is enough to have it. It's exclusive. You know, it's super exclusive. It's not 500 pictures. It's it's 28 very personalized images and they're very considered. And it's a good amount of time. You know, people can look for mm. it in five to 10 minutes and there's real value. If you hand them over a massive portfolio, it looks as, as thick as a, a magazine catalog, like a, a, a an online mm. magazine catalog. People... Oh. They, or a 20 minutes video. Or a 20 minute video, yeah. People, <laughs> people just, they, people check out and, you know, if you look at uh, TED, so on YouTube, they mm-hmm. have technology education design. Right. All of their videos are under 20 minutes. And the reason they do that mm. is because humans humans cut off after about 18, 20 minutes. Like they just lose interest naturally because their mind wanders. And, you know, you don't want people's mind to wander. You want it to be totally fixed on what you're presenting to them. And, mm. and 28 pages is, is perfect for that, in my opinion. Nice. So, and you print it uh, in hardcover, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Correct. So I do. Okay. What I do is I print in hardcover, and the finish I have on the pages is always matte. And the reason I use matte is high gloss is very reflective, and when light mm. shines on it, it can look bad. Like some people right. have different preferences, but whenever you pick up any luxury goods and it's matte. You just think, oh, quality mm. straight away. You know, like right. someone hands you a business card and it's a matte finish business card. You're like, oh, you're doing exactly. well. Like it's and it's just the finish I like to, to add to my prints. Mm, and it's also better, I guess, to to print your photos for exhibitions in that. <laughs> yes, because if you have the the lights shining onto it, or probably you have it uh, behind a glass framing. Correct. Uh, yeah, you want to make sure it's just as there's no glare off of it, so people can spend the right. time and appreciate it from any different angle, which is which is great. Right. So what would your number one tip be you learned uh, to become 
a successful photographer, so to speak, for regarding the transition. So what was the key finding the key, for you? Uh, the key finding for me was, um, I think the networking was crucial. Mm. So like spending time to understand who is who and also open up connections with those people. So my Facebook page, when I first started, I started off with like a hundred friends on my Facebook and, and they were like family and friends. And every time I met people, I went and added them. Like I, you know, straight away added them and, and, and started to build it. And, and it almost, well, not almost, but effectively, my Facebook is effectively my core, my key demographic. It's surrounded by people in the industry who, you know, have some involvement to a certain degree. And it's really good for sharing my successes because I have a captive audience. Like this audience mm. are, are connected to me and they can see it. From me. And that networking is, is crucial. And it's the same for if you're doing concert photography and gig photography. Mm. You just need to get connected to the the managers of artists and the people that run the press, and you know it's it's so 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 important. Mm. Uh, so, would you say Facebook is your number one social media channel? Facebook is great because you can tell a story and people engage. Mm. Because, like, when you check into Facebook, it's like it's personal downtime, so people tend to give it a little bit more consideration. And mm. if, say, for instance, my my Facebook business page, like, I don't share so much on that because. Facebook business page, people cut off because it's a, you know, they, people know it's a business trying to sell to them right. as a business. Whereas when it's personal, it's Luke Curtis, it's the story of Luke Curtis. And, and so many people, you know, always comment on like, Luke, your story is amazing. And, and that's because they've been involved in the story and they understand it from, from the beginning to, to where it is now. So I would mm. always share stuff from my personal page. Of course, you know, there's a, there's an element of balance in personal and work life, but You know, the people around me are people that I'm comfortable with in, in my social sort of circle. Mm. So I'm, I'm happy to, to share. Mm. This is also what I found. Uh, if you're posting on your, or if you build your personal Facebook page, uh, you will um, yeah, get a lot more attention yes. with from people because uh, they also, also more people will see it in the newsfeed uh, compared if you have your business page. Correct. Because I think nowadays it's just if you don't boost uh, your post it or pay nowhere. for Facebook ads, it goes nowhere. Correct, yeah. Very, so, it's so true. And and the way Facebook works is, well, like if you don't boost, it doesn't go anywhere. So do it on your personal. Right. And the, the way I see it is when when people like your content, when they like it, their friends are notified that they like it. And say, for instance, mm. you have a, a social circle and a couple of them have a thousand friends and two thousand friends. Like, it's more audience that your your content can get in front of. And it right. goes back to the saying: if they can't see it, you can't sell it. Mm. You have to get the you have to get the work in front of people. Right. The only limitation with a personal Facebook account is that it's limited to 5,000 friends. Yes, yeah, correct. So I, I, I reached this limit, so <laughs> Same I, here. I'm, thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, no, I was thinking to get a, a, another personal Facebook account with a kind, of a, kind of a different name, but uh, I didn't do it because it's getting too complicated and I don't want to split up then. A hundred percent, and I think... So that's too much. So on that point, I think you're very correct. And I think you, if, if you start to have multiple accounts, like I don't know whether you you like dilute your your credibility mm. to a certain degree so so what i do right. now is i really make a point of drawing people to my other social platforms and what i'm trying to do now is my youtube is i'm trying to build my youtube mm. platform that's where i want to go to to next because you know instagram cool. i've kind of nailed facebook i kind of get you know I'm, i'm totally comfortable there and for me it's like the youtube channel because it's such a like YouTube as an audience is, is huge. Mm. Like it's the biggest social media platform available in the world. Like it's, it's absolutely huge. People, you know, can view it all over the world. So I want to start to push my work down that mm. route. So what I'm starting to do is on my, my personal Facebook page is share my YouTube videos and, and draw people to, to that social platform. And I think, again, it's really personal because it's me talking to camera. Right. You know, it's, it's great. Yeah. Uh Love the videos. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about the photography business side, um, most people struggle with, with this side and most likely they, no one knows how much they should charge and, and so on. So how did you go about this and, and with the pricing structure of your work? Yeah. What's your approach on this? So, so my approach, people may or, or may not agree with it, but I, 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 I work on time. And the reason I work on time is time is, you know, 
oh, you, you, you never get time back. Time is so valuable. And that's mm. the thing that people complain it's, about most in life. It's, I wish, it's the most valuable asset, I guess, oh, that we have. It's the most valuable asset to any human being. And, and I, mm. I see myself as I'm selling I'm selling time effectively because you're taking my time to be at your mm. event to shoot you. And, and that time I don't get back and, and you want to get value from that time. So I would, I charge on a, on a, on a time basis. And, and that okay. time varies depending on what I'm shooting. So the value is different from shooting a festival or to shoot in a smaller event or to shoot in portrait, but I will always charge per hour effectively. And then what okay. I do within within that hour, I have a breakdown of, you know, what I need to cover as expenditure. So how do I get to the event? How do I get away? And and that's how right. I would work it. And if someone says to me, okay, Luke, I'm probably going to need you for, for four hours or five hours. Well, this is my price per hour and this is how much mm. you pay for those five. And for me, it's a very easy mathematic equation to work out, you know, if I'm in profit or I'm out of profit in terms of running a business. And And when I first started, you know, the first club I ever shot in, you know, I was paid £10 an hour and worked four hours uh, a night and worked three nights a week. So I earned £40 basically. And it was, okay. it was, it was no money at all. And, and, you know, it, the reason it was no money is because I was very early in my career and I had no value. You know, I, I wasn't, I, had, I didn't have good enough work to, to ask for mm. more money. And, and I totally get that. And I think when you start to become paid, don't like some people have this idea that you know you're going to be a superstar photographer overnight and be paid loads of money like you have to like a footballer for instance you know you have to go and play for <clears throat> the lower ranked teams before you go and play for the you know the sort of the uefa teams and the, the the premiership teams before you get paid more money for what you're doing so um so yeah but on an hourly basis is how i would do it and that tends to work for me and, and it's very clear for my clients they get it and if they want me for longer time they they pay for, for more, which is, which works. <laughs> so you charge only the hours you're there for the shooting or also the hours you need for post-production? Uh, so for the, what I do basically is what I charge is for, so say for instance, they're shooting within that charge, there's also consideration for the edits. Um, so okay. they basically, so if I was to say, okay, it's a hundred pound an hour, that's inclusive of the mm, editing time everything. as well. Yeah. So okay, that's, okay. that's everything. And then I would give them an, an ETA for when they can expect to get the edits back as such. Um, mm. And that way for me, it covers, you know, it covers the time I need to spend in post-production and it covers mm. the time I'm shooting at the event. But I think as you get, as you get better and better as a photographer, you start to define your own style and it's easier. The post-production pr becomes easier and easier. Um, so right. you spend less time in post-production because you have your presets. And when you're shooting, you know where the image is going to go in the end. So you shoot to consider the presets mm. and the workflow. So it's so much easier to be able to push the work out. And, and that, that time becomes shorter and shorter. And you know, as a businessman, if you charge per hour, the less time you then have to spend on that hour like the, the more money you earn from it effectively so right. you just run it as a business right even though the client doesn't know um how much time you spend in post-production right i mean that's always like a flexible yeah thing. that's totally you flexible. can also say okay i'm i need two hours for post-production but in the end you just need 10 minutes because you have the presets but yeah. you charge for two hours yeah correct so, so but I, I think that's totally up to everyone how to deal with oh, it. 100%, yeah. So find a balance. I would say, so my balance would be is if I charge somebody an hour at their event and, you know, they, their expectation might be that I will take an hour then to to then do the edits. I'm only going to charge them the hour that I'm at the event, if that makes sense. Um, so mm. they're not being charged the two hours, you know, and I'm not, and I'm taking 10 minutes on it. I know that I can spend an hour right. there and do the, the, the edits, you know. I think mm. being tech savvy helps as well. Like it helps so, so, so much because... When when you master the the technical ability to be a photographer, like you can shoot in manual and you know what you're doing, the only way you can make more money from what you do and become a more profitable business is refine the process to reduce the workflow. Mm. And there's a lot of things I use. So I've I've got a video on my so I shoot tethered when I do portraits and I have basically a a Pele fifteen ten case and it's custom designed which allows me to take all of my, <laughs> all of my kit. So my workflow again is like massively shortened and, and that's working mm. smarter, not harder because, you know, the only thing you can do to, to earn more money and be more profitable and is, is basically shorten that time. You know, it's look, if you look at like a production line, you know, the mm. longer it takes to produce something, the less money you earn because you produce less. So, you know, you have to speed it up. And it, for me, it's not all about money. Like I do it for passion But when you get to the point of being freelance and having to pay your bills, like, of course, it's, it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial. Mm. And 
you have to be honest with it, you know, with people, you know, I'm a freelancer. I, I have to pay bills like you have to pay bills. And this exactly. is, this is my trade. And as long as you're clear and very transparent with it, people won't have an issue and they will, they will value it as well. So mm. are you shooting by yourself or do you have assistance? <laughs> Um, I shoot predominantly by myself and I, I sometimes I have assistance, um, depending on the project, depending on how big the project is, I will ask mm. for assistance or, or not ask for assistance. I, I quite like being a bit of a lone wolf in terms of like going off and, 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 and shooting my own stuff and having, it's, it's not, it's, it's through fear of relying on others, I guess, to a certain degree. <laughs> and that's why my shooting style is very it allows me to do that. And I have like this, the, the, the travel case, for instance, rather than having mm. an assistant and things like that, what I would tend to do is I have this travel case. I use capture one as a software and okay. capture one has what's called capture pilot. So I can basically uh, create a closed wireless network. And when I take pictures onto my Mac, they straight mm -hmm. away deliver to an iPad. So if I'm shooting with say, for instance, an artist and their management team, I can give the management team the iPad. I can just concentrate on shooting the artist. They've got an iPad over in the corner. They can see the images. It keeps them away mm. from the, the creative side of things. And, and I don't need a team to support me to do it. And I think especially when you're shooting portraits with an artist, like it's very intimate and, and it's about the relationship you create with them. And the more people are there, the harder right. it is to do that. Um, so, so yeah, but if it's a really big project, I have previously had some, some amazing assistance, which is, uh, yeah, which is always good. And I, I'm happy to have assistance, not to support me. I would rather have mm. them there to learn. So if someone said to me, Luke, I want to come and see what you do. I would say yes to that all day long because I just, you, know, you have to share the information you collect because not enough people do it. So mm. if someone said to me, I want to assist you and, and get paid, I'd probably say, you know, I can, I can do it on my own. But if someone says, you know, I want to come along and learn, I'll say, yeah, sure. Come along and I'll, I'll then pay you for goodwill and you learn something mm. from it because I would rather support the learning curve then someone just be there as sort of like, you know, I don't want someone right. to ever want to just be an assistant. I want them to say, I want to do what you do, Luke, and I'm going to learn mm. what you do so I can Definitely. go and do. Yeah, correct. That's awesome. Thank you. That's a good approach. Thank you very much. Two, two less people are doing this approach, I guess. Yeah. Most likely people say, oh, it does, doesn't matter if this is not this uh, cost money. I have the money and uh, I don't care what he's doing or she's doing. It's just she should yeah. do the work, but... I think. I think this is this is the problem with um, the, the the arts, like uh, photography, uh, videography, is so personal. Like my images are, are personal, you know, they're personally tailored and created by me, and and they have so much of me in them. And it's the same for any photographer. Mm. And people people are scared about giving that up, and that's why there's such a closed. Like people really close themselves off through fear of giving away too much right. and and letting people you know be able to compete with them directly and my and I, and I always say this you know you should want people to compete with you because if you're not competing you're not getting better exactly. and, and and that's a real that's a real dangerous thing you know you always want to be better and I, I spend so much time like I'm I'm dyslexic I'm not a great writer and reader but I have so many magazines in my apartment and it, I look at the pictures. I genuinely mm. buy magazines to look at the pictures just so I can see what other photographers are doing and try to take that into my own style of work. Cool. So uh, how hard is it in your opinion to make a decent living from photography nowadays? So you're a pro photographer now. Yes. Correct. Yeah, correct. Um, how hard is it? Well, it's taken me nearly 10 years to get to the point mm -hmm. to do so. So I think it is, 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 is hard but I think it's a very rewarding career and that's why it is hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it, Exactly. you know, and that's, you know, so you have to invest some time in yourself and some time in the process to, to be able to get to that point. Of course, there are more and more people taking pictures and photography is so accessible. You know, you just look at Instagram, for instance, there's so many people using Instagram on a daily basis. Like everybody can be a photographer. Mm. Um, so it does make it more competitive. But like I said previously, I think that competition should make you want to do better every time. Like you should never, you should never fear people. Like I, on my Facebook, I have anybody that takes pictures in the same sort of industry as me, I have them on my Facebook and I make, you know, I'm so open about commenting on their posts and liking what they do, you know, because I'm so open to, to just improving everything as a whole like i mm. want it to get better as a whole i don't want to keep it closed and you know like i mentioned earlier some of the older generation they're fearful of losing their livelihood so they keep it close to their chest and i think that's a really dangerous game and i don't think it's very productive for the whole 
you know, photographic uh, the photographic world. Mm, yeah, I totally get it. And I also think uh, you have to overcome the fear that you're kind of losing a job or something. Uh, mm. But it's always better, I guess, to be here for the community, talk to these guys, work together, because we are all sitting in the same boat. And I mean, it's sure it's about money, but in the end, it should be all about passion. And I think everyone is passionate about it. And a hundred percent. I think you have you have more credibility when you're open mm. and you share and you work with other people, like, you know, you just have more credibility in yourself and you learn so much. I learn as much from the other people around me as I do from any other source. And it's so mm. good to do it. And I love when I see, I see other photographers, there was a guy called Danny Flack and I was searching through Facebook and he's based up in North, in the North of England. And I came across a set of images through somebody else liked them and shared them on their Facebook page, uh, like a mutual friend. And I, uh, I straight away just sent this guy a message, and I was like, "Danny, these pictures are amazing. Like that, they, they are, they are so good. Like just the, the styling and and what he decided to do with the light. It was something I'd never seen before. And I just straight away had to approach him mm. and say, "Hats off, man. That's that's pretty cool. And I think there's there should be more people doing that. Right. That's that's good. Uh, did you had ever any doubts of becoming a photographer? Was it the right decision? <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah. Now in hindsight, looking back, definitely the right decision. And I'm, I'm happier than, than I've ever been. And, you know, sort of my partner, Robin supports me so much in doing it. Mm. And she was with me from the beginning when I was shooting in a really bad club to, to where I am now. And like, I think it's helped our relationship because we've grown together and she supported me and I've been so grateful of the support. So yeah, I'm, I'm so happy in terms of like the decision to become a photographer. Mm. I, as a kid, being dyslexic and stuff i never i never thought i was creative and i didn't really know where i was going i was good at business because i was always good at being able to present and be able to sell effectively um and i never considered being a creative and like i say when i found a camera i opened up this this new world i was like wow i could be creative it's, mm. you know, so yeah i'm very happy to to be a photographer yes would, would you say you're living your dream 100 percent. yeah absolutely 100 percent. and it's it sounds really cliche and I don't say it to, to brag because I don't think you can brag over something that's been so difficult to start with, mm. you know, but I'm, I'm yeah, definitely living a dream and really happy. And cool for me, it's like changing my direction now. Like, where do I go from here? I don't think you should ever say, right, I've, I've got a front cover of a magazine or I've done this. Like I want to just keep on, keep on going. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. So for the short Q&A section, I will ask you seven short questions and please answer them as quickly as possible. N okay. Nikon or Canon or another brand? Sony, all the way. <laughs> <laughs> which, which camera model do you have? Uh, so I'm on the A7R2 and the A7. So between those two cameras, I can cover all bases in terms of producing podcasts and, mm. and vlogs. And the A7R2 is just... Oh, it's just an amazing camera. Like I know people always shout about their gear, but I just two years into having it, okay. it still blows my did, mind. It's such a great. So gear. you didn't start out with Sony right away? <laughs> yes, I oh, did. Yeah. yeah. So did. my first my first camera was a Alpha fifty eight, and then I got a Next five N, and then I've just stayed with Sony all the way mm. through. I've never had anything else. Cool. So if you can only choose one lens for your music photography work, which one is it? Thirty five one point four, without a shadow of a doubt. Like you know the sigma r 35 if you shoot full frame and you shoot on 35 it's like the perfect marriage it's, it's beautiful mm. like so that would be the one all the time okay favorite record of all time favorite record of all time armin van buren uh so armin van helden sorry you don't know me okay is there any music photographer you admire uh yes and it's a bit cringy admitting it because we are now friends but <laughs> um ryan dingham for me and i'll always say it and i'll continue to say it like he Without his inspiration or his influence on my life, I wouldn't be where I am today. So, yeah, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Your coolest concert you have shot so far? Uh, coolest concert was Kolsch in Paris. So I flew over to Paris to shoot Kolsch, who um, who played an eight-hour set underneath the Eiffel Tower. Eight and hours. it was just... <laughs> unbelievable unbelievable <laughs> like it was just it was life-changing one of the most yeah crazy crazy cool uh water or beer uh water okay and uh which band or which dj is still on your um bucket list 
Armin van Helden. So uh, he, he's my, you know, he, I have his song is my favorite song, and I've never shot him, and uh, I, that's what I want to do. So he's like my, he's on my list of people I want to shoot 100. Cool. And for the last question, uh, what is your must-have tip for someone who wants to start out in the music photography <laughs> scene? Uh, if you know, once you decide that you want to be a music photographer. Go and stand in front of a mirror and ask yourself if you like if <laughs> if you really 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 want to do it and you're prepared for how difficult it's going to be and you have the the tough skin to be able to survive it and if you say yes to that then 100 percent put all of your effort and soul into it and it will come right mm. and and even if you're not quite 100 percent sure uh it's it's a process and uh even if you say okay i'm probably not so prepared for it but i, I would like to give it a try Give it a try yeah. anyway and, and see how it works out. A hundred percent. You don't know if you like it unless you try exactly. it. Like my little girl, Isabella, when she says, oh, daddy, I don't like that food. I'm saying, have you ever tried it? And you said no. And say, well, try it first and then decide. And it's the same for this. You know, give it a try. And if you like it, then continue to pursue it. Exactly. And this is why I always tell my students and followers not to Uh, get into depth because they just get a full frame camera with all the full uh, frame lenses in the beginning <laughs> because they shoot to concerts and they don't like it. I mean, they are screwed. So just start small 100%. and and yeah. Well, I said to I did a video also and I just basically said, you know, when you go and buy a camera, buy a camera with a kit lens. Mm. And the reason they have a kit lens is because it covers, you know, a whole range of scenarios and that will give you the ability to test you know, what you do right. and don't like. So cool. Thank you so much. So Luke, where can people find your work online? Of course. So I'm on all of the social platforms. So on Instagram, my Instagram page is at lukecurtis.co.uk. My Twitter is Luke is at Luke.curtis, but rather than a dot, it's spelled D-O-T. So I try okay. to be super creative. So <laughs> it's L-U-K-E-D-O-T-C-U-R-T-I-S. Uh, also website. So my website is www.lukecurtis.co.uk. And from there, you'll be able to find all my other socials, such as my YouTube channel and my LinkedIn and, and everything. Perfect. Thank you so much, Luke, for your time. It was, was great. And I really loved the stories, especially the one where, you, how you got into photography. Uh, because of your daughter, Spirth. Thank you. So, I, I really, a, a huge honor. So thank you very much for asking me to come sure. along. And hopefully that, you know, the content is enough to inspire, you know, the next generation of music photographers to go out and sort of do as amazing as sort of the other people that have been podcasted. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, no see worries. you soon. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. This was a brand new episode of the How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast. And before you go, I want to say a huge thank you. So here is where you can find me. I am Matthias Hombau and basically all over the internet on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And you will find my blog at www.howtobecomearockstarphotographer.com or simply htbarp.com. It's also super important to share my podcast with your friends. Subscribe to iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and or Pocket Casts, so that you don't miss any new episodes. I'll publish an interview once a week from the best music photographers on this planet to help you kickstart your concert photography career. And if you're awesome, please leave a review on iTunes. This will make my How to Become a Rockstar Photographer podcast more visible and you can actively help to grow our concert photography community. The last place where you can check it out and get some additional value is in my newsletter, which is howtobecomearockstarphotographer.com slash VIP. This is where I put content out before it hits my social platforms. So this is sort of the insider track. Leave me comments all over the internet. I'm tracking them down and try to answer every single one. A huge thank you again for listening to my podcast and I'm looking forward to the next episode. I hope you'll join me. In the meantime, go out and shoot some concerts. Rock on, Matthias. you committed over an hour to that whole video and the elements of the podcast and stuff thank you so so much i really appreciate it
and appreciate you just taking the time and watching the channel. I think, yeah, as much as you should give stuff away, you should always make time for showing gratitude when people give stuff away to you. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, catch you all soon.